Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 16 of Project Odyssey. At the end of last episode, we were transferring some fuel and doing various other things like going on EVA. We'll get to that in a moment. Notice the jiggle in this spacecraft. Apparently, transferring the fuel is causing the center of mass to shift around, and that is causing it to then jiggle a lot. So uh, what I did here was I simply did a quick save and reload and that solved the problem. If you ask me, that's what you call Space Kraken Averted. You can keep trying to avoid the Space Kraken, but you can never get away from him completely, and so you must therefore be very vigilant. And that means that when Jebediah goes out here on his EVA, he's going to grab some parts that are going to improve our ability to avoid that Space Kraken once again when we make our burn off to Minmus. Step one in the plan is we're going to put some RCS quads out on the nose of this craft because I tested the engine out by powering it up just a tiny bit and I noticed that it was starting to pitch down. So I figured, oh, what I forgot was to put some RCS on the nose. That'll help keep the nose up. Another thing I think we can consider is what the mass values are of that lander and the return capsule but we'll get to that in a moment we're going to put on that quad right there in the front it's a little bit crooked but as long as I put the other one on the other side in the same way I think we might be okay and then the last thing that we're going to do is put some struts on here, the kind that in Kerbal Attachment System allow you to go out and on EVA connect parts together. And this was actually planned ahead of time. I was figuring that I might want to strut the lander and the return capsule down to the main body of the craft. And so I have brought up specifically four struts that are over in that case. And we're going to go and get them now. It has definitely been a while since I've been out doing this kind of thing, going out here and constructing stuff, and I gotta say, I definitely missed it. This is one of the fun things you can do in KSP. Engineering things that you actually build with your hands, or well, your virtual hands, I guess. Excellent, that first strut is in place, and now we'll put down the second one, well, strut end point, actually. We'll put down the second strut end point, not quite where I want it. Move it a little bit closer to the front here. Grab it by clicking link, move over, hit the other one, hit link, and we'll have our first connection. And hopefully it won't spontaneously explode. So of course I'm hitting F5 right before I make those connections each time, because if you remember from Project Gate, way I had a few instances where hitting that link was causing things to just explode. The first one went in just fine though so we'll grab another strut endpoint and put it down here on the bottom. Get the very last one, shift over to that lander, put it on the lander and strut that up and then we'll be all ready to start the fuel transfer to try and balance things out. Now I went down into the VAB and I took apart the assemblies that I used to launch these, both the lander and the capsule, the hydra up top and then looked at how much mass each one of them was dry. And then I figured out how much fuel I would have to transfer into either the top or the bottom one in order to make sure that it had the right and equal mass both above and below. And as it turns out, the lander is a lot heavier. So we're going to be transferring fuel up into the Hydra capsule. And with that, it'll balance out and everything will be great. Jebediah has concluded this EVA and all of the construction, and with the sun rising in the distance behind our beautiful little ship here, he will go inside and we'll begin that fuel transfer now. We're going to move fuel up into the Hydra service module right here. Zippity 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 zippity. Liquid fuel and oxidizer, off you go. And then we're going to shift it out of the lander. And we'll put it in, back in the lander when we actually get to Minmus and we need it. We can move it all around the ship. Think of it as just one big pile of fuel and we can assign it to whatever happens to need it. What I'll probably do is just load up the lander, go down, come back, and then unload the lander again in order to use the fuel to switch back into the hydro capsule 
so that we can use that to get home once Hadfield has been cured. And now I have powered up the engine. I believe that I might be on the right trajectory here to get an intercept with Minmus, so I simply powered up because I can see it in the distance and that usually means that you're on target. Uh, now I've only got it up to about a little over one third and I'm throwing in the RCS because I was thinking, well, I got this mono propellant. I might as well just hit H and, and power that as well. It's a less efficient fuel and I don't really need too much of it for maneuvering so I figured I'd throw that in. Burning that is reducing the overall mass too which is uh, giving Delta V back to me from the actual liquid fuel oxidizer portion of this trip. Now it's time to find out if I was right if we are going to get the intercept, yes, although I do want to get that really low down over the north pole of Minmus, so we're going to have to make some kind of maneuver after we have gotten underway here. But for now we're going to do our Star Trek shot and watch as Kerbin recedes behind us here and we are on our way. Next up, we're in the unmanned simulator. We are trying to get some fuel tanks that we can send to the moon. Empty fuel tanks, actually. And what we're trying to do with these is fill them up with fuel that we have produced on the moon. And we want to get them there without using more fuel to get them there than it's going to bring back, right? Because otherwise, what's the point of doing it in the first place? So this is a test of trying to get empty fuel tanks to the moon using only solid rocket boosters. This is the very first test, and as you can see, it's not really going so well. The basic idea of the problem here is that those boosters are normally used to send up regular payloads. And so now we're just in that exercise of staging everything one after the other just to see if that all works even remotely the way that I want it to. Now like trying here the actual parachutes to see if they'll do any good if it were re-entering, coming back with the fuel and trying to land with those. Uh, but the problem was because those are normally used with fuel tanks and real liquid engines, it means that they have that throttle back which gets them up a fairly decent height but then when they throttle back again uh, as they would normally do on regular launches in order to be able to go through max Q at a lower dynamic pressure we're not getting high enough we're not getting fast enough we start losing our velocity and gravity takes over the research and development crew is now running the test for a second time but they've made a change what they want to do is have a staggered start to those solid rocket boosters. The outside ones began first, and then the middle one kicked in second. Unfortunately, that means the outer ones are done a little bit sooner, and when they decoupled, they didn't do a very good job of staying clear of the middle one, and that blew it up. So instead, we just go on knowing that this is just a test. We're going to see how the second stage here does with the solid boosters. Unfortunately, it's fairly difficult to actually control and keep going in the right direction. There are several radially mounted liquid fuel engines on there and a tiny, tiny bit of fuel in the tanks, allowing those radially mounted engines to act basically like vernier rockets to uh, keep it going in the right direction. This test is going much better than the first one at least. We didn't blow up as much of the ship here and now we have gotten as high as we're going to make it pretty much because those vernier rockets, they're not really doing much for steering it when there's nothing else propelling us. They're not really doing that much for actually keeping even on the target, the going the right way basically. And so we're just going to test the re-entry capabilities of this craft now. So it's coming down on a heat shield that I have on the very end of that fuel tank. The theory being that if we can just get it to survive through the atmosphere and then have an adequate parachute, we'll be able to slow ourselves down and actually recover this tank of fuel. 
But it's back to the drawing board as we try yet another slight change in the design, seeing if this one does any better. We're still using that same idea of lighting the outside ones before we do the middle one, but there still isn't enough control of our vector, our attitude. At least one thing got better. We did manage to improve the decoupling and didn't blow up the middle booster, but ultimately this is way too low and is not going to succeed. Another design with little changes, but unfortunately this one has difficulty with the way that it decouples all of the boosters and we can't get pointed in the right direction. Also, we have a few other little problems. We go back, we try to improve those and we come up with yet another design. This time there are extra solid boosters down on there. You can see them on the outside edge there. We wanted to put those on because we needed that little extra boost to make Make sure that we were high enough that the atmosphere wasn't affecting us once we finally decoupled and we could stay on target. Unfortunately, those boosters just aren't enough to actually provide enough velocity to get going anywhere. So now it becomes a decoupling test again, a test of the parachutes coming up in a second as well. And then we see the next problem that we're going to face. That parachute looks way too small and it's opening way too late and it's not slowing down the payload at all. Then comes the next test, which is the last of the ones where I actually try to send three at the same time. I finally smarten up and do two things. One, make a bigger solid booster, and two, switch to using just one fuel tank. Because the basic idea is we just wanna bring back more liquid fuel than we sent in order to get it, right? Well, that means that all we need to do is send one tank, and we can do it more than once if we have to. We just have to make sure that each time we send one big fuel tank, that it doesn't use up as much as it's going to bring back. It's as simple as that. We don't have to send three tanks at once. We can send them one at a time. So after a few more attempts at different tests using just one fuel tank, I now bring us to the actual flight test. It's turning out that it's a little bit difficult to control the rocket as the booster is throttling back. So it gets off of its prograde vector, but then once it starts throttling back up again, it's very easy to maintain it going in the right direction, just using the booster itself and those little vernier rockets on the side. In fact, why don't we go real quick down into the VAB, take a look at this, and then we'll come back and I'll show the rest. First, here is one quick look at the final version of Moon Fuel 1. As you can see, like I was showing earlier, it had three solid boosters on it. This is the final version though, where the boosters are very big. In fact, they touch each other, they're so big. I tried reducing them a little bit, but then I realized I didn't really need to do that. I just needed to send up one tank and get rid of the two side ones. But you can see it had a whole bunch of stuff on there that's pretty similar to what you're about to see with the single tank version which is here. So we've got it held down with some clamps and originally I just had a single booster but then I added these extra ones on the side because I realized that the same problem I was having earlier was happening with this one where it would throttle back to go through max Q but it would throttle way too far back. Now these helped with that. So then we have the middle one here and of course it's got more lights on it and it is a 3.75 meter solid booster. Take a look at the stats over here. It's a brand new one, so it's way in the bottom of my thing. There it is. It has a massive 8,532 thrust. It's got the same ISPs as a normal booster, but because I've increased its maximum thrust, then I can go over here and check out the thrust controller and set it to wherever I need it. So it's a way higher than normal, but that's because back when I was first doing all of this, there was no such thing as tweakables in here and now because you can actually tweak these around i decided the higher thrust allowed me more flexibility getting back to it over here you can see that it has a whole lot of solid fuel although at that thrust it burns through it pretty quick look at that 502 per second moving our way up 
after we get rid of the lights. Uh, you can see that I had to put that other strut idea that I used from the other video there where I have some struts on decouplers in order to hold this down. I wanted to make absolutely sure that those came off at the same time that this decoupled and that there were no problems whatsoever. Plus, by putting the decoupler underneath the strut, it allowed it to come out a little bit away and make sure that it went down from the side to the booster. Because if you try to put these things on sometimes like this, let's grab one and we'll put it right there. Uh, let's turn off that. So let's say you're grabbing that and you're trying to connect it down there. See how it doesn't go all the time? Now, sometimes what you can do is put on a strut like this or something. And then when you grab that, you can put it from there down and that, well, that still didn't even make it either. Well, I'm having trouble with it and that just goes to prove that that's what you have to face sometimes when you're trying to connect from one piece to another and there's other things in the way here. Moving our way up, we have some vernier rockets, basically. There were six of them around the outside. More lights around it all. Little bit of monopropellant. I didn't really want to put on much. I put on the four radially mounted RCS on there. Uh, and, and the tiniest, tiniest bit of monopropellant. I actually expect that those may burn off on its way back in when we're re-entering. Here's our docking port because eventually I am going to have a lander on the moon that will come up here and it will dock to this in order to refuel it. Now it may have to come up and dock many times, but it's all going to be essentially an automated system. And so therefore I shouldn't have to worry too much about the fact that it's making multiple trips. As long as it keeps filling it and as long as this contained less fuel going up, than it does coming down. If it brings back more, then the whole thing will be profitable. And as you can see, it only has about a third of the total fuel that you can store in here. So every single time we launch one of these to the moon and have it filled up, we're going to gain all of that when it comes back. Even though it may take 10 trips to go from the surface up to this thing and fill it up, all that's going to do is limit how fast we can launch things. It's not going to limit our capability. Plus, as you recall, Valentina's working on that project that will allow her to transfer fuel directly from the moon right into our warehouse because Kessler had her working on that wormhole device. Okay, moving our way up here past more lights, we have a couple solar panels to make sure that it can uh, actually have the power it needs when it's time to come home. It's going to come home on those engines that I showed earlier. It doesn't take a lot of thrust. Even if it took an hour for the burn, it still will eventually be able to get back and it's not going to use up very much fuel when it comes home. And finally, we have up here, of course, a couple of communications antenna and the actual computer itself as well as a scaled up size parachute which I have tweaked the parameters for that I have tweaked the parameters for using the real shoots editor okay so we're back in orbit and the thrust of the solid booster had dropped way way back as it got near the end of its life and that kind of threw off our trajectory just a little bit, but once we power up those little rockets on the side, we are easily able to get us pointed in the correct direction, circularizing our orbit and preparing for our transfer over to the moon, because we didn't actually launch in this particular instance with the moon on the horizon. So I, I had to go around about three quarters of the planet before the moon came up and was in my sights to make our burn over there. Now, normally I'm all about, let's just get this done. I want big engines, fast engines, but these are small and it was not going very fast. It took a quite a long time to make that burn to get all the way over there to, to the moon. This is 10 times normal speed showing the expansion of that orbit right there. Just to give you an idea how long that actually took to get over there with those tiny little engines. But once we made it, we were able to get that periapsis around the moon quite low. 
Back on Carbon, the team has been working on the Jewel mission, getting that ready, figuring out how we're going to collect that gas from the upper atmosphere that we're going to need. But they do take a moment away from their busy schedules in order to watch the telemetry as it comes in of this tank making it to the moon. Because if this doesn't work, we're not going to Jewel. We need this fuel from the moon if we're going to get to Jewel to save Hadfield. And that's not to mention the amount of fuel that we're going to need in order to transfer several ships to Duna in order to make the base so that we can live there for as long as it's going to take in order to dig up that artifact or whatever it is that we're going to need in order to activate the wormhole that's going to get us back to our own dimension. Back here at the moon, I'm only throttling up a little bit because I'm slowly adjusting my approach. I have a maneuver node there, but I'm not really paying that much attention to it. I'm sort of flying by the seat of my pants. I know where I want to be, and I'm lowering myself down to get just over the surface. And then we're going to circularize from the far side at about 10 kilometers if we can. The next part of this mission, once this tank is circling around here at the moon, is we're going to have to send the lander that will be able to go down, collect the fuel, and come back up again, filling that tank with all the fuel we need. If we can prove that we can do this once, we'll just imagine that we're continuing to do it as much as necessary until Valentina's project is finished. While that's going on, back here, the Minmus Traveler is halfway along the path, and my intercept right now isn't very low over Minmus, and I need to get it low enough to make sure that we're actually able to capture. So I'm about to make a burn that will hopefully, uh, maybe even just with monopropellant, even though there's not that much left over up there, we're going to try to get that intercept really close to Minmus right now. I haven't really done the math to know whether or not I'm going to have all the fuel that I'm going to need, so every little bit is precious here. Since I have it all split between three different engines, we have the return vessel, we have the ship itself, which we're using right now to lower down the periapsis around Minmus, trying to get it over the pole. We also have the lander, and on top of that, I'm having issues with the orbit not seeming to be able to lock in. There must be precision issues or something in KSP. So I'm going to get myself a little bit closer here and just keep my fingers crossed this whole time that we're not actually going to get here, slow down, get down onto the surface, get that mineral that we need in order to save Hadfield, and then find out that we're stuck here. Because if that's the case, we're going to be here for quite a while waiting until we have the fuel from Valentina in order to come with like a refueling vessel or something in order to rescue these guys but hopefully we have enough since it is spread out between three different tanks right now i need to transfer a little bit more into the actual engine that's going to slow us down here over minmus because by my estimate i don't think about 140 was going to be enough i want closer to 200 now i've put it just over 200 delta v and that should be enough to slow us down after that we'll transfer all the fuel out of the minmus traveler and back into the lander the lander will then go down come back up again and whatever it has left it'll transfer back in again and so we'll just keep doing that we'll move the fuel around until it's all gone or until we've made it back home now, as I make my approach here, I'm noticing the effects of the Better Atmospheres mod. It's putting those dark splotches that are popping in, it's putting those on Minmus, and I don't think that's how it's supposed to look. I tried going out and editing the file that set where the clouds were, but that didn't seem to really do very much. Then later, I found the user interface that allowed me to modify in-game, and still, I have all of this banding that's going on. So I reloaded and tried again. You hit Alt-N when you're using better atmospheres, and that'll bring up this debug menu that you can see right here. And that allows you to modify different values about where the altitude of the clouds are, what kind of color it should be, how big they should be, that sort of thing. And you can put different layers, add all the layers you want there, and do whatever until you find the settings that you're interested in. And then you just hit Alt-N or hit Close there and make that little dialog go away and carry on about your business. 
After some tweaking, I was at least able to get it to not look like a dirty mud pile. It's popping still, there's banding still, and I'm not entirely sure I know what to do next. I can't update because I'm still using 2.3.5. I'm not going to update Project Odyssey because I think it's just going to be too difficult to do that. So I have to live with these older versions of the mods. Checking in on everybody else, we have Bill, Neil, and Kesla still up here at Odyssey Station. All is quiet and the research is going ahead as planned. Valentina is down in the research building working on Kesla's Moon Stabilizing Fuel Integration Transit System, otherwise known as MISFITS for short. Jules' launch window is upon us and therefore we are also getting ready to launch Jules' mission in the very near future. On the Minmus Traveler, we have Hadfield, Jebediah, and Joseph who are now transferring into the Hydra Lander because it's time for them to set their course to land on Minmus. We need to collect those minerals needed for Hadfield. The lander is still strutted to the station, so Jebediah has gone outside in order to decouple that, and then we can actually do the undocking. We're back inside now, transferring fuel from the station into the lander. We're basically going to take pretty much everything we can get our hands on, because we're not going to need it up on the station. We're all leaving. We're going to come back later with whatever we have left, and that'll be what we use to get ourselves home. The trimexal hydrozone can only be found on the poles of Minmus, so we've decided based on the inclination that we, no, based on the eccentricity of the orbit that we have right here, that we're going to go for the north pole because the periapsis was closer up there than it was in the south. So we'll make a little burn here, bringing down the periapsis to just barely over that north pole. I had noticed before we started this that the solar was down just a little bit. We were at half power, so I put the panels out, hoping that that would bring in a little something while we're coming into position here. Landing gears out, engines on, the burn has begun. It's not that much. It's only just a little over a hundred meters per second here left to go. So we're just angling straight toward that horizon, and it shouldn't be long now before we're down on the ground. While we're waiting, I'd like to just relay a little bit of information about the channel. So I've been receiving some comments on the channel discussions and on the video discussions and stuff, people asking questions, and I love to answer all the questions, but sometimes YouTube doesn't give me the opportunity to actually reply. Some people say reply and other people don't, and I guess it's probably some sort of permissions issue, but just so you know, if you're posting a question and I don't have permission to reply back to you, don't expect an answer. Okay, we're coming down now. We've almost landed. I'll just comment one more time about the channel while we wait here. Another common question is, hey, where's the next episode? Well, these come out on Mondays. Project Odyssey is every Monday at 6 or so a.m. Pacific time. Ah, uh, looks like Joseph is putting out the scientific instruments and the communications and we'll put the ladder down and we can go outside and take a look around and start looking for those minerals. Let's see, another common thing I get asked is, hey, can we have the mods for this? Well, remember that I'm running on 2.3.5 still and probably everybody else is upgraded to 2.4.2 by now. I really don't think you're going to be able to run it because all the mods have been updated and all of mine are old and so if you're updated you won't be able to go. Also, you don't even need to ask if I could zip up my game data folder for you because I am not going to Dropbox 770 megabytes of info out of my own bandwidth. I'm sorry. Well, next time on Project Odyssey, Joseph, Jeb, and Hadfield are going to have to go out and finish their science experiment to prepare that medicine. We have to make mid-course corrections for the Duna communication satellites. We need a Cathane lander at the moon. We need Valentina's Misfits device sent over to the moon as well. We may need more solar power and battery to handle the dark side for the Odyssey station because it seems to be running a little bit low sometimes. We need to get the Jewel mission underway. And finally, will an unexpected event throw the base into chaos? Find out next time on Project Odyssey. Until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.